Parkway Baptist Church Sunday evening service. One of the things we like to do every Sunday evening is start out singing a scripture song. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse 3 is where you'll find our scripture song.
chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. And uh, what a blessing to have the opportunity to preach uh, for our church and uh, to Living Hope as well, joining us in our services. Really appreciate you guys coming and uh, really thankful for Pastor Beer and uh, thankful for Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick's an awesome man. It's, it's so good to be around. He's got such a great spirit and uh, what a blessing. Um, just to give you, before we get into the text, the uh, preacher wanted me to make sure, uh, in light of having Living Hope with us, uh, you get to know who I am. Uh, <laughs> what I'm all about. And uh, so I got saved uh, when I was 20 years old. Now I'm 28. And um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home per se. Uh, my dad uh, was a Christian and my mom later was a Christian but raised Catholic. And uh, they're sitting in the back right there. The guy with the giant mustache is my dad. He's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I was not pulled or pushed in any direction of faith. Um, I attended a Catholic school, I attended a Baptist school, but uh, nothing really uh, stuck. And I claimed to be Christian, yet I did not understand the gospel, and I had not accepted Christ as my Savior. Uh, but God had a purpose for my life, and it had a path for me. And uh, it was my senior year, uh, we are playing football, and I can trace it back to then when God put me on the path uh, where I would get saved. And um, I, we were, I was got the starting position, nailed down, we're going to have a great season. Before the season even starts, tear every ligament that I could in my knee. And so that ended my season. <laughs> and uh, that literally kept me at home, kept, you know, I, I couldn't go to school uh, for several weeks because it was right when school was started. I had a really intensive surgery, it was really rough. And um, that kept me in home, and that made me, you know, get a job around town. It made me go to JC around town. I went, I went to uh, Mount St. Vincent College in Menifee. And there uh, at Stater Brothers, I was working in Marietta. Uh, some girls were selling chocolate, and, you know, this is going to offend some people, but I really don't care for chocolate. <laughs> uh -oh. I, I, I was ready to duck in case they didn't make fun. Um, I really don't care, but my dad is like a chocolate fiend, you know, so I bought chocolate for him and uh, brought it home for him. And the girls were real nice, and uh, one of them, she uh, uh, was a regular, and I recognized her, and I was like, oh, you go to church. Okay, well, I don't to put it together. I was worldly. And um, six months later, uh, God had broken me, and really, really hard. And uh, six months later, um, I heard her inviting someone to church, and they were were not really receptive to that. I, I kind of figured that. I, I knew the guy. And um, he wouldn't go to church. He just wouldn't. But I was listening and I was like, you know, the question that really throws every Christian off when you, you're used to inviting people to church and you get doors slammed in your face. I walked up to her and I was like, is it okay if I come to church? <laughs> and uh, she was like, what? Because <laughs> who asked that? You know, I, I didn't know. But I, uh, I came to church on Friend Day. You guys joined us on our Friend Day. And, uh, the Friend Day is a special day because that's the day I got saved uh, at church. And uh, I got saved uh, March 16th, uh, 2008. And uh, the devil was working on me before I even got to church. He was trying to get out. I was thinking, you know, I could just say, I got a flat tire. I could just say, you know, I was trying to come up with all these crazy things that I did not want to go to church. And uh, uh, I went into the Sunday school. It was so awkward. I was 20 years old, and they had me go to the teen department, which was like really <laughs> weird. I was like, they're out, like, out of control, candies and whatever. I was like, but anyway, <laughs> their youth pastor was pretty wild. He was a funny guy. And, um, well, their youth pastor happened to be teaching a lesson that morning. And so he's going through, and he's, uh, he's going through in uh, 2 Corinthians where it says, be not unequally yoked. And he talked about how when he was a teenager, he had to make decisions and get away from friends uh, that were bad and pulling him in directions. And I was sitting there thinking in my head, like, I'm getting all kinds of trouble because of my friends. You know, uh, all the trouble I've ever been in was because of my friends. And, uh, you know, get around the wrong people, you're going to do the wrong things. And um, it was uh, it was working on my heart. And as I uh, sat there, I was convicted. And I went to the next service, which was uh, Pastor Goddard from Wildemar Faith Baptist Church. And he preached hard. <laughs> and it was great. Cut me to pieces. And uh, uh, I ended up trusting Christ as my Savior. And my, I brought my parents uh, that night. That was the morning service. I brought my parents that night. They were my first visitors to church. They couldn't believe it. They are like, who are you? <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was pretty crazy. And the next five months, God really worked on me. And I went to Bible college five months after I got saved. Wow, that was hard. <laughs> it, was, you know, it, it was hard. 
because I was not, I did not like authority <laughs> as an unsafe person. And uh, I went to Bible college and, you know, ironed out all those things that I had wrong in my life and God really worked on my heart. Met my wife, she's not here because uh, our boys are sick. And the next one just got sick this afternoon, so I'm looking forward to the next one. Next one. But um, uh, met my wife there and uh, we got married, moved out here literally the day after we got married. Uh, started interning for my home pastor, which was Pastor Bruce Goddard. And then uh, I met um, Pastor Beard on a mission trip, and it was awesome. I mean, that was an incredible mission trip. And uh, uh, we became friends there and communicated here off and on. And then in July of 2008, or no, sorry, not July 2008, July 2014. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> sorry. Um, he uh, met with me at Chipotle in Minifee, and he talked to me about a need that the church had. And uh, he probably had other plans for me, but he talked about you young adults and his burden for you and how much he loved you and how much he cared about you and how much he knew you needed your own ministry leader. You needed uh, uh, direction. You needed somebody to, to have a Sunday school and have activities for you. And uh, it became my burden. And I saw his vision. And by September of 2014, that's when I first came on staff here. And uh, it's been a great awesome time ever since, and well, it was all right, we get along, we share an office, <laughs> but uh, no, it's been great, and I love it, and I love this opportunity that I have, and uh, First Peter, chapter 5, so that's my testimony, Amen. enough about me, let's talk about the Word of God, First Peter, chapter 5, I've got a pretty, uh, the, if you were in soul winning yesterday, this was uh, the lesson I taught, but it was very brief and very concise, and this is uh, the expanded version, very detailed. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, and starting at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd had appeared, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And verse 8 is the main verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you just uh, be with our time here. Such a blessing to preach the word of God, never take it lightly. And Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and what he did for us. And we did our best to lift him up. And Lord, we're so thankful for a church that lifts him up. We're thankful for living hope being able to join us today, Lord. And we pray especially for our pastor as he's trying to get over his illness. We pray for Pastor Rick as he's traveling. Keep him safe. Give him travel and mercy, Lord. And Father, we just thank you so much for uh, the unity that we have here today as Christians, as believers. Pray that you be with our service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter four, or sorry, chapter five, and you see verse eight, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If you're unaware of it, Satan is out to destroy everything that God has established. He's out to destroy it. And our world around us in the last 50 years, you would know, it's become more evident that uh, the presence of Satan is taking over America. And uh, he is rebellious, and his rebellion began long before he ever slithered his way through the Garden of Eden. Satan despises God, for he desires God's position. Isaiah 14 tells us, For thou hast said, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Uh, Satan's biggest issue was pride, and that caused his fall. And Satan's whole purpose is to keep everybody from hearing the gospel. Satan doesn't want anybody to get saved. From following after God or from hearing the gospel, he wants everything he can and he will do everything he can to destroy the church and discourage Christians. Uh, uh, Nathan Goodpastor, one of the missionaries that Pastor Beer and I met on the mission trip that we first met and got to know each other, uh, he had his little boy, two, two, three years old? Two? Okay. Two years old. Uh, they found a brain tumor. They're in the Philippines. Now, that is not the kind of care that you want. You want first class, not third world care. 
And they came uh, back just recently. They were able to fly, but the pressure of the plane flight put pressure on his tumor. And it was causing immense pain, uh, just immense pain on the little boy. And the devil will try to use that to destroy that missionary. Amen. He's going to try to use it. Amen. He'll use anything he can to destroy it, to discourage him. But Nathan, good pastor, I've seen him on Facebook. You know, he's posting, you know, hey, we're just trusting the Lord. We're just trusting the Lord. And he's getting the care he needs now. And uh, no matter the outcome, you know, God is faithful. And tonight, we have several points, and it has to do with Satan. And the title of the message is, Satan does not want you to learn. Satan does not want you to learn. But before I can give you my points, it's important that we understand who Satan is, as he's described here as our adversary in uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Adversary, by definition, means a person or a group or force that opposes and attacks an opponent, an enemy, a foe. That is the dictionary definition. You know what the third definition on dictionary.com is for adversary? The adversary, capital A, Satan. Satan. That's interesting. The worldly dictionary knows that the adversary, the third definition is Satan. The adversary would like to destroy you. As we see in our, our text here in 1 Peter 5 8, Satan is described as a roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's quite an analogy when you really think about it. Uh, a roaring lion walking and about, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, we're all familiar with the serpent in the garden. However, a roaring lion, you have to keep in mind the, the time in which this was written. First Peter is believed to be written around 64 to 68 AD. The Colosseum was not built to, until 70 AD, where they had their famous battles and their executions. And that was about two to three years after Peter's death. There, but, however... There were prominent arenas where the Romans had, you know, their destructive things and they had their people and their battles and their famous battles. The Colosseum was just the prominent one known about it. However, there were other arenas where the gladiators fought and Christians were executed afterwards. And many Christians were bought, brought to these arenas to be killed in battle reenactments or by wild animals. So everybody was very familiar with what a roaring lion could do because they starved those animals so that they would kill people quicker. And uh, anyone in, under the Roman uh, Empire knew what a roaring lion could do. Many of the first century Christians that got saved, no doubt, had seen some of these carnage. So when Peter writes about this, it's very known what's going on. It's very known, okay, the devil is as a roaring lion, that's, that's intense. That's, it's, it's, it's very understood. It hits a chord with the people because they're very familiar with that at time. Why do we need to understand who Satan is? Because he understands everything about you and your sinful nature. As uh, Christians, we believe not that the world is, you know, billions and billions of years old. We believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. And in a short lifetime, uh, we hope to overcome him as best we can. But in 6,000 years, he has studied how to get us. He knows how to get us. And he's studied human nature. And me, as a 28-year-old, have no idea even about my human nature as much as he knows about my human nature. He knows how to get us. So we have to learn how we can uh, get away from him. And uh, in, in a battle that we face against our adversary, it's important to understand our attacker. The Japanese, when they attacked Pearl Harbor in uh, December 7, 1941, they didn't just plan that overnight. Did you know that they had been planning that since 1932? That's intense. They've been planning it just in case they went to war with America. They've been planning it for years. That's why it was so perfect and concise and so destructive. And so we need to make sure that we study our enemy. Satan does not want you to grow. Satan does not want you to learn. Hence the title of our, our sermon, uh, Satan does not want you to learn. There's going to be several points that we have under that, which is why uh, some of you have a sheet of paper. James 4.14 says, Whereas you know not which what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? Is it even a vapor for a little time that vanishes away? Our vapor passes so quickly, we got to be prepared for Satan. We need to be, as 1 Peter 5 says, sober and vigilant. Because Satan can ruin a life in one bad decision. I tell my uh, young adults, I say, I, I tell them all the time, I said, you are one bad decision away from being homeless on the street. That's all it takes. It just takes one. Satan gets you one time and really ruin your life. And uh, we don't want to let that happen. We want to be sober. We want to be vigilant. Turn to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. 
Why does Satan not want you to learn? Why does Satan not want you to learn? Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. That's right before Proverbs 2. <laughs> the Proverbs, in starting at verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give sub subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Why does Satan not want you to grow? Because he doesn't want you to have the wisdom you need to survive. He doesn't want you to have the understanding. He doesn't want you to have the knowledge, the understanding, especially, especially from the Word of God. He'd rather you be knowledge in what famous singers are doing and what famous actors are doing. He'd rather you be standing in line as the first person to see the new movie that's coming out on Friday. You know, you can get there Thursday, Friday, whatever. I haven't been in a movie forever. I don't know. But uh, he wants you to see those wicked movies. And he wants you to be there first in line because we're more apt to be in line and getting a pre-order ticket for a movie than we are to be in church on time. And that's exactly where Satan wants us. But now back to the message. Amen. Satan doesn't want you to learn. And here's the points that you can write down. He does not want us to learn about salvation. He does not want us to learn about salvation. Satan is the opposite of God. Satan wants everyone to die and to go to hell. He never wants you to hear the gospel. How Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and how you can become a son of God by salvation. How you can learn about being saved by grace through faith. He wants you to do uh, the best you can to understand and believe that you get saved by works. That's what Satan would love. He wants you to believe if you just do enough good, you will go to heaven. Well, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. Amen. He wants you the best to do to believe uh, that he can confuse you. I couldn't get myself in heaven on my own. I couldn't do it. I need Jesus. I need Amen. Jesus. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It took the Son of God to pay for my sins. I could not do it on my own. Satan would love for you to believe that you can get yourself into heaven. Because if you do not understand grace and faith and salvation, you're still on your way to hell today. You need to get that taken care of. Satan does not want us to learn about salvation because if we learn about salvation and we get saved, we can also teach others about salvation. You heard my testimony. I got saved, but it's nothing that I did. It was everything that God did in my life. That's right. And it's all the glory and honor and praise to Him. It's nothing that I did. People tell me all the time, God, it's so cool that you went to Bible college five months after you got saved. Like, That's all God. <laughs> There's nothing that I did to make that happen. That was God putting me in the right place at the right time. And, and you can even ask my parents. It was unbelievable just how God worked in that situation. Right. Satan does not want to see one soul trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. But that's not what God wants. That's not what God wants. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. No matter how bad they are, no matter how much wicked they've done, God does not want them to go to hell. Satan does, but God doesn't. Satan does not want you to learn about salvation, which leads you to the next point, point number two. He does not want you to learn about forgiveness on a personal level. He does not want you to learn about forgiveness on a personal level. He does not want you to understand the grasp and, and grasp the wonder of forgiveness. How he has truly forgiven all your sins. I know my dad got saved in December 1972. And he was arguing with the preacher back and forth, going over it. And uh, he was like, I, I don't know, man. I don't think I could get saved. He really believed that he couldn't get saved with all the things he's done. He's told his testimony. He said, I broke all ten commandments. And he, he told that to the preacher. And the preacher went over his scripture with him and told him, hey, look, showed him the life of Paul. 
And my dad ended up trusting Christ as his Savior and getting saved. Amen. And, uh, you know, we might have that doubt, but that's put there by Satan. Thanks to Christ's payment on the cross, he took care of everything. So, uh, Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he, hath he removed our transgressions from us. You cannot find my sin. God can't find it. I can't. And uh, God forgave my sins, and you cannot find them. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for my own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Amen. That's pretty Amen. clear. That's right. That's pretty clear. God, the God doesn't know my sin. God doesn't recognize my sin. God, God doesn't remember my sin. Satan does not want you to learn forgiveness on a personal level. Why? Because he wants you to beat yourself up. That's right. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to feel discouraged. He wants you to feel negative about yourself. If you're doing that, you're probably not serving God, and Satan has you exactly where he wants you. There we go. And he just wants to destroy your life. He wants you to stay discouraged. If you've ever confessed your sins, even if it was before you got saved, Satan wants to discourage you, and he wants to beat you up with your past sins every now and then. You know, I'll be sitting there and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, man. Start thinking of some old thing I did. Like, that was before I got saved. Man, I was stupid. I was so dumb. Come on, Jason. Ugh. Well, that's Satan. Yeah. That whole thing right there, that's Satan working on me. Because he wants to discourage me. He wants me to be depressed. He wants me to be discouraged. Some memory from before I got saved that doesn't matter to God anymore. Satan's trying to use that to discourage me. He can't have my mind, and I'm sure, well, he sure can't have my soul. Yeah. Pastor Beard, uh, 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 I start to feel some guilt, and um, I, I, I think of Pastor Beard, and, and uh, he's like, Jason, you're good. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I walk in all the time, I'm like, all right, preacher. <laughs> and uh, I talk to him all the time, and, uh, and I say, okay, what am I in trouble for now? That's how I walk into his office. I'm, I'm never in trouble, just so you know. <laughs> I'm never actually in trouble, but that's how I walk into his office. I just joke with him. But uh, sometimes we have that kind of feeling about God. What did I do now? You know, you, you can feel that guilt, but that's the devil trying to beat you up. That's the devil trying to beat you up. Satan doesn't just want you to understand. He, just, he doesn't just want you to understand personal forgiveness. A discouraged Christian is handicapped. A discouraged Christian is hindered. Satan tried to hinder Paul. It's 1 Thessalonians 2.18. Wherefore, we should have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan's doing everything he can to discourage you. He wants to stay discouraged. If you're discouraged, eventually you leave church. If you leave church, eventually... It's all downhill from there. Yep. And it's a destructive, destructive pattern. He does not want you to learn about personal forgiveness. Number three, he does not want you to learn about faithfulness. He does not want you to learn about faithfulness. Faithfulness is one of the attributes of God. Faithfulness irritates Satan. And that's what I love about faithfulness. Because it irritates Satan. Why? Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessing. Shall abound with blessings. There is blessings in being faithful. There's blessings in being faithful. Satan hates faithfulness because God is faithful. God's faithfulness combats his temptations against you. If you pray and you ask God, take care of me. And even Jesus at one point had to say, get thee behind me, Satan, because he started to irritate him and he started to try to get him. First Corinthians 10, 13, there had no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above you are able, but with temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Satan hates the whole Bible, but man, that verse has to be irritating. That's got to drive him crazy. God is faithful, and no matter what Satan does, we have a way to escape. No matter what he does. Satan thinks he's all powerful, he thinks he's all bad, he's walking around to and fro, and he'll go around and he's trying to destroy lives, and he's trying to make sure that nobody did save, yet, no matter what, we have a way to escape that temptation. Isn't that something? Amen. Amen. God is faithful. And that's why Satan does not want us to learn to be faithful. All the work of Satan can be put to destroy your life with temptation, but God gives us a way out every time. That's right. Satan does not want you to learn to be faithful. Why? Because then you're going to become faithful to the things of God. Then you're going to become faithful to the things of God. And if you're faithful to the things of God, this really irritates him. You can be used. 
Okay. Okay. Right. And that really, really irritates him more than anything. If you're faithful to God, you can be used of God. You know, Satan, as much as he hates the assistant pastor of the church, he hates the ushers. And it's not just because they're late. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you're serving God. There's a purpose. There's tithe money being collected. That drives him nuts. You could use that on a brand new pair of, you know, whatever, shoes, Jordan, I don't know. You use that on a hundred different things. Satan wants you to spend your money on everything but the work of God. All right. To help in a Sunday school, to clean a church property, to help in the teen department, to help in the young adult ministry, to help your pastor, to help as a deacon, to help as an altar worker, and as uh, really I ever found out, to help in BBS. And that was a blessing, right? I had 40 workers on average of BBS all throughout the week. That was awesome. Praise the Lord for that. And faithfulness, that faithfulness irritated Satan. Because those children were under the teaching and preaching of God's word Amen. for four days by faithful workers. Forty workers that showed up, more than 40 some on uh, some of the days, but showed up faithful to the cause of Christ. Showed up faithful because they care about our young people and they want them to learn. They want them to grow. That's right. All of this faithfulness arose the plan of Satan to destroy our lives. We have some young people here uh, here watching those my age and older, watching to see if we're going to stick around, if we're going to be faithful. They're watching Brother Edward, the whole youth department, to see if he's going to stick with it, to see if he's going to be faithful as the youth pastor. They're watching me to see if I'm going to be faithful. They're watching pastor, is he going to quit? Is he going to give up? Is that usher going to quit? Is this deacon going to quit? Who's quitting next? Because there's a lot of people quitting church. There's a lot of people unfaithful to God. And Satan loves that. He loves unfaithful. He doesn't want us to learn to be faithful. Unfaithfulness is simply doing Satan's will. That's what it comes down to. If he can get you to be unfaithful, he can get you to do other ungodly things. Everyone okay? Amen. <laughs> Get nervous. <laughs> All right, point number four. Satan does not want you to learn to pray. Satan does not want you to learn to pray. How irritating do you think it is when Satan hears the audible voice of a Christian praying? Must drive him crazy. Not that 20 second thanks for the food prayer. Not that repetitive rosary nonsense. Not the Lord's Prayer repeated over and over. I mean deep relationship spiritual prayer with God. Turn to Luke 11. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 11. You guys see this. It's too awesome. It's just one verse, but it's okay. The disciples heard Jesus preach, but they never asked him how to preach. The disciples heard Jesus teach, but they never asked him how to teach. The disciples heard Jesus pray. That's what they asked him how to do. They asked him how to pray. Luke 11. One. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he was when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, prayer life is so important. We could write books and books and books, and you could read a ton of books on prayer, but if you're not actually praying, it doesn't mean anything. Right. Satan does not want you to learn how to pray. The biggest hindrance to the wiles of Satan is a praying Christian. Through prayer, we defeat Satan. Through prayer, we get strength from God. Through prayer, petitions for others. We ask of God. We seek of God. We beg of God through prayer. How is your prayer life today? If it's hurting, you're right where the devil wants you. He doesn't want you to learn how to pray. He doesn't want you to have a spiritual relationship. Is it short? You're right where the devil wants you. When 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Can we really pray without ceasing? Uh, one of the famous uh, theologians and writers and commentators on the Bible, John R. Rice, uh, it was described as a man that as he walked around, some of the people that uh, chauffeured him around when he was in speaking engagements, uh, they would say he'd be muttering to himself in the back seat and they didn't understand what was going on. And then uh, one of the guys caught wind of it and he said, he's praying. He's praying. And as he was driving, he'd be like, oh, pray for that little girl right there. I'll help her to find Jesus if she's not saved. He prayed for people as he was being driven around. He just pray for people on the streets. That's praying without ceasing. Amen. 
People used to, uh, as I said, think that he muttered to himself, but he was just praying. Do godless Muslims have a better prayer life than we do? Yikes. They're faithful to their prayer life. I would hate to travel to the mission field in the jungle of some place and a witch doctor has a better prayer life than I do. That's pretty sad. When they don't have the truth, when they're wicked, and they don't have the truth, and they have a better prayer life than us, to their heathen gods, that's the problem. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, I gave this illustration yesterday in our outreach meeting. Charles Spurgeon, uh, we all know him, he was a famous prince of preachers. And uh, some young uh, guys came to his uh, church, and they were looking around, and they're all wondering, you know, the stargaze kind of guys, and, you know, sign my Bible and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, they came to his church, and they saw an older man there, and they said, hey, can you show us where his office is? Because uh, we know that's where the power comes from. We want to see his office, where Charles Spurgeon's office is. The man, gentleman, walked down, and he led them down a set of stairs, and they were thinking, this can't be where his office is. We're going downstairs. And so they went downstairs. And remember, this is in the 1800s, so it was dark. They had a lamp and everything like that. It's crazy. But they're going down the stairs, and they stop him midway, and they say, well, wait, 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 wait. We wanted to see his office where the power comes from. He said, I'm going to show you where the power comes from. They continue down the stairs. They get down the stairs, and there's thousands of people praying before the church service. Thousands. Young men couldn't believe it. It's not the power of the pastor's office. It's the power of prayer. And Satan certainly does not want you to learn to pray. Number five, Satan does not want you to enjoy, to, Satan does not want you to learn how to enjoy reading your Bible. Notice I did not say how to read your Bible. I said enjoy reading your Bible because there's a difference. The best-selling book of all time, the Bible happens to be the most neglected book of all time. How do we know this to be true? Our world has only gotten more wicked, as I said before, more perverse, more ungodly, more indecent, more uh, filthy. The Bible is the compass for our lives. The Bible is the GPS of our heart, mind, and soul. And if we get off track with the Word of God, we're in a, we're in a hard place. The greatest conviction that I have doesn't come from preaching in church. It comes from my personal devotions when I'm reading my Bible. That's where the greatest conviction comes from. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, Man, that, that one hurts. You know, you know, and you get convicted. Uh, God, the devil does not want you to learn to enjoy reading your Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study the word of God. Your relationship with the Bible reveals your relationship with God <coughs> or the lack thereof. That's right. That's right. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word of God. The Savior who died for you and me is the Word of God. And Satan hates the Bible. He hates God. He hates Jesus. He doesn't want you to have a relationship with Him. If you do not read Him, read the Bible, you are right where Satan wants you. If you do not like reading it, you're right where Satan wants you. He has twisted the word of God from the beginning. If you look at Genesis uh, 3 1, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you. Genesis 3 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan puts question marks where God put periods. Amen. He always wants to twist the word of God. He always wants to take it out of context. He always wants to try to work it. That's why it's so important that you have a relationship with the Word of God. A lost relationship with the Bible is, has been the ruin of this nation. Mm -hmm. George Washington said it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Amen. Yet that is exactly what we're doing right now. Fifty years ago, God and the Bible were kicked out of public schools. Are we really surprised where we're at right now? Point six. Okay. <laughs> Point six. Satan does not want you to learn to serve. Satan does not want you to learn to serve. As I said before, it probably irritated him that there was 40, over 40 workers on average at BBS last week. Probably drove him crazy. <laughs> Satan does not want you to, Satan wants you to live a life based on self. He wants you to 
live a life based on self. Selfishness is one of the favorite marks of Satan. If Satan can get you to be selfish, you will never be faithful. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but love. But by love, serve one another. If there was any message that Jesus Christ taught during his earthly ministry, it was others. He washed his disciples' feet. He right. healed the sick. He Amen. healed the blind. Right. He healed the lame. He died for the sins of mankind. Right. He was all about service. And Satan doesn't want you to learn to service, to, to serve. Which brings me to my next point. Number seven. Satan does not want you to learn how to win a soul to Christ. He does not want outreach programs. He does not want soul winning programs. He hates the fact that we run buses on Sundays. Absolutely hates it. You're bringing people to church that can't get to church. He'll do everything, and Brother Edward knows this, he'll do everything mechanically possible to try to get those buses not to work on Sunday. Brother Edward has been sweating <laughs> blood, tears, everything. I mean, unbelievable things he's had to go through to get the bus ready on Sunday. But, praise the Lord, we get the buses right the majority of the time. Yeah. Satan does not want you to learn to win a soul to Christ. Proverbs 11.30, uh, the fruit of the righteousness is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. This is where we get the term soul winning from, which is our outreach program, otherwise known as outreach. And that is witnessing to people about Jesus Christ. So they can get saved. There is wisdom in winning a soul to Christ. Amen. The last commandment of Christ was for us to be soul winners. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts 1, 8. In case you thought it didn't end at uh, Matthew. Acts 1, 8. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Satan does hates these verses because that means that there is less people that might go to hell. Because if we are a witness, if we follow and obey the commandment of Christ before he left, we're sowing. We're, we're doing outreach. Christians have an amazing opportunity to be in two places at once. Does anybody know how? Come on. Missions giving, sowing. You get to give the gospel in two different ways in one location. You get to be in two different spots. You give to missions and you go so many on a consistent basis. Satan does not want you to learn to win a soul to Christ. He is hoping that more people go to hell. He is hoping that more people stay lost. And the best way to do that is he wants to give you every excuse of why you cannot win a soul to Christ. Every excuse of why you shouldn't win a soul to Christ. Every excuse of why you're unable to win a soul to Christ. He wants you to believe that you're not eloquent enough. That if people yell at you at the door and they're mean or they're, you know, whatever they might do. I've dealt with it all. It's unbelievable. But uh, it's okay because I'm still going to go soul winning because that's what God wants me to do. That was Jesus' last commandment. I'm not going to ignore that. That's right. He does not want you to push for, for soul's sake. Jesus is with you while... You witness. Did you catch that last part of Matthew 28, 20? And lo, I am with you all. Amen. Even unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm with you all. When we go solely, he's with us. When he's there with us. If they reject you, they're rejecting him. It's really what the issue is. Jesus does not want you to witness to others. Uh, when I uh, when I was going to college, I, the reason why I married my wife is because, not only because she was really pretty, but uh, the reason why I married my wife is she was just like me. She she wanted to win souls to Christ. She was the number one soul winner in our division, and it was awesome. I was like, and I was the number one uh, male soul winner in our division. And um, when I graduated, I had witnessed and shared the gospel and led 1,300 people to the Lord by the time I graduated in four years. And uh, I want to continue to push to win souls. Amen. How much is enough? Never. It's never enough. That's right. Why? Because people are still dying every day and they still are going to hell. There's still nations out there that have yet to have a preacher. There's still nations out there that have yet to hear the gospel. There's still nations out there that have yet to hear the name of Jesus Christ. How do we lift him up if they don't know? That's right. Yeah. Satan doesn't want you to learn. To win a soul. That is the heartbeat of the church. Soul winning. 
That is a commandment given by Jesus before he ascended. Sounds important. Number eight, Satan does not want you to learn to teach a class or take leadership in a ministry. Satan does not want you to learn to teach a class or take leadership in the ministry. That voice that says, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not able. You can't preach. You can't teach. Come on, you? No. That voice, that's Satan. Right, right. That's not God. Right. That doesn't sound like I can do all things to Christ. Amen. Amen. Right. You're not good enough to usher. You're not good enough to teach Sunday school. You're not good enough to help the pastor. That is not the Holy Spirit. That is Satan trying to discourage you. Of course, Satan does not want you to serve. Serving means that you're helping the work of God, and that hinders the work of Satan. Your pastor can use you if you're only willing to be used. Amen. Satan does not want you to learn to serve in the ministry or to take the leadership. Number nine, Satan does not want you to learn to have a good name. Satan does not want you to learn to have a good name. He wants your testimony ruined. Ruined. Satan wants your name tarnished by sinfulness. Proverbs 20, 22, 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. You can be the richest man on the planet. You can be the richest man ever. But if your name is trash, what does it matter? Right. What does it matter? That's right. Why is a good name so important? Well, if you ever run for president, <laughs> as we're finding out, it might be a little important. <laughs> I'm not sure who has a better name, but it's interesting. Well, certainly, the weaker vessel is much worse. But uh, my dad used to tell me that uh, your reputation gets there before you do. That was his motto to me, his mantra. He'd tell me that all the time. Your reputation gets there before you do. If people are talking bad about you, it's because you did something prior to that. If people are talking good about you, it's because you did good stuff prior to that. That's right. And that's, that, that, that's how he raised me. And me, your name matters. How others perceive you matters. Are you known for wickedness? Are you known for lying, cheating, stealing, being late to work? <laughs> are you known for punctuality, character, honesty? integrity, godliness. Are you known for having a good name? Right. A good testimony. Because that mixed with faithfulness, mixed with all these other points, irritates Satan. Satan doesn't want you to learn to have a good name. He wants to destroy your name. Just like he tries to destroy the name of Christ. This book that we have here is full of wisdom. So much wisdom we can't even fathom. And how to rear my children, how to stay married, how to have a good marriage. So on and so forth. It just, it just goes on and on and on. The list. That is a whole lot of stuff that Satan does not want us to learn. He doesn't want us to learn to have a godly life. If Satan doesn't want us to learn these things, it's probably pretty important that we learn them. Amen. It's probably pretty important that we take them seriously. Satan does not want us to have a relationship with God. Satan does not want us to learn how to pray. Satan does not want us to learn how to enjoy reading our Bible. So we must take what we have learned as Christians and use it against Satan. Amen. Back in that bottom line. Why is America suffering right now? We have generations of people who have not learned to read their Bibles. Who have not learned to pray. To have a happy marriage. And the divorce rate is, uh, there's three popular times to get divorced. After the first year of marriage, after the first kid is born, and after the last kid leaves the house. People have given up. And there's some states now you can just, you don't even have to get divorced. It's seven years and you're done. If you want to be done. It's, it's not even called divorce anymore. But we know the dates that our favorite team plays. But we don't know how to pray. We don't know how to read our Bible faithfully. We can't teach Sunday school. We can't have a good name, but we know how to defeat level 10 on our new uh, Xbox or PlayStation game. We know what movie's coming out, when it's coming out. We already got the first ticket purchased, but we don't know how to read our Bible. Amen. We know every word to the latest rap song, but we don't know how to pray. We are either in the will of God or we're right where Satan wants us having learned absolutely nothing for the cause of Christ. Satan doesn't want you to learn some things today. 
you have those points. Now, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do? We've ought to be learning. Nobody has ever arrived. Even Pastor would say that. He has never arrived. He's always learning. He's always reading. I've seen, Brother Edward and I have seen his office. He's got stacks of books he hasn't even gotten to yet. It's unbelievable. And we've got to be ever so learning. Let's all stand.